Okay, great. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so as Alana has said, I um, have a split role. I'm a, a clinical psychologist, but I'm also a researcher and I have a particular interest in both BDD, body dysmorphic disorder, and OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. So for me, it's really exciting to be part of this um, amazing conference today. And I'm really um, happy to be able to talk to you about some um, work that my colleagues and I have been doing looking at the question of whether or not um, detailed focus processing, um, by which I mean having a real eye for detail and sometimes finding it difficult to step back and see the bigger picture, if you like, whether this type of processing is linked with body image problems. And I'm going to talk about um, some research that we've done looking at this question in body dysmorphic disorder and anorexia nervosa. So I'm going to start off by talking um, a bit more generally about how BDD relates to other mental health disorders. And then I'll focus in um, talking about the links between BDD and eating disorders. And then I'll move on to this issue of detail focused processing and talk about it as one possible example of a feature that BDD and eating disorders have in common. And I will um, tell you a bit about the results of our recent research in this area. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about the um, implications of our research for, for treatment and recovery from BDD, because really that's our ultimate interest and that was our um, motivation for carrying out this research in the first place. So I think everybody um, who's attending um, this session is probably already expert in BDD, either through lived experience or through training. Um, so I'm not going to spend long talking about what BDD is, but just to briefly recap so that we're all on the same page. Um, body dysmorphic disorder is um, a condition that's um, characterized by preoccupation with uh, flaws in physical appearance. And what's interesting is that these flaws um, really appear as very, very minor or even completely unobservable to other people. But of course, Nevertheless, they're still a source of great distress to the person with BDD. And these concerns tend to be linked with repetitive, time-consuming behaviors um, that the person carries out in order to fix or um, conceal or check their perceived flaw in, in appearance. I think a really important question is, how does BDD relate to other mental health disorders? Um, and this is really something that we're still figuring out. We don't have all the answers, um, but I'm going to talk about um, a bit about what we do know so far. So today's conference is on um, BDD and OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and it's no coincidence that these disorders have been put together. The reason that the BDD Foundation and OCD Action have linked up is because we know BDD and OCD are very closely linked. And that's reflected in the um, manuals that us clinicians use when we assign diagnoses. So we have two main diagnostic manuals. Um, they're called ICD-11 and DSM-5. And within both of these manuals, um, BDD falls under the category of obsessive compulsive and related disorders, along with OCD and a range of other disorders. And the reason that these um, disorders, OCD and BDD, have been put together in this category is that they have very similar features. Um, so one feature that they have in common is obsessional thinking. In the case of OCD, obsessional thinking might, for example, focus on um, fears of contamination. It might focus on a fear of harm coming to people. Um, in BDD, obviously, the obsessional thinking is focused on the, the worries about appearance. So the content is different across the two disorders, but the quality of, of, of the thinking processes is very similar. Um, so the, the, the thoughts and ideas tend to get stuck in the person's head. They're recurrent. They go round and round. And they're very powerful and, and difficult to ignore. And a second feature that OCD and BDD have in common is um, the repetitive behaviors that I mentioned. Um, so in OCD, repetitive behaviors um, 
might include um, washing or cleaning, having to arrange things in a particular way, counting, checking. In BDD, um, the repetitive behaviours that we, we commonly see are things like um, excessive grooming routines, so having to do um, your hair in a very particular way, um, camouflaging through clothing, through makeup, um, having to check your appearance repeatedly, for example, in a mirror, um, and um, comparing your own appearance to that of other people. So again, the, the behaviours themselves are different in OCD and BDD, but the quality is very similar. In both cases, people describe these behaviours as being um, feeling compulsive, feeling that they have to do them in order to cope with day-to-day -day life, even if these behaviours a very time consuming place, a big burden on them and, and really interfere with, with their day to day life. So it's really clear that OCD and BDD have um, strong commonalities, but of course BDD has a lot in common with several other mental health disorders as well. And on this slide, I've just put what I think are some of the most important ones for us to be thinking about when it comes to understanding BDD. So you can see at the top um, the overlap between OCD and BDD that I've talked about. Um, but we know that BDD also has a lot in common with social anxiety disorder. So both BDD and social anxiety disorder um, involve a really intense fear of negative judgment or negative evaluation from other people um, and therefore often um, quite intense anxiety in social situations. And BDD also has a lot in common with depression. Um, so both of these disorders involve um, a profoundly negative view of oneself. In BDD, um, that may be mostly centered around appearance, although often I would say extends beyond appearance. And in depression, the, the negative view of oneself might be quite pervasive and encompass appearance. So there's definitely overlap there too. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see I've put eating disorders. So like BDD, most eating disorders um, involve body dissatisfaction and a sort of um, a really poor body image. And I think this is such an important area, which actually hasn't um, been researched very widely so far. And it's an area I'm going to talk more about um, today. So what are the links between BDD and eating disorders? I've mentioned that BDD and eating disorders share many features. Um, so perhaps most obviously the fact that they um, involve poor body image and a sort of disturbance in body image. Um, so people with BDD and eating disorders tend to see themselves differently to how other people around them see them. We also know that both involve these repetitive behaviours that I've touched on. So I've mentioned some of the repetitive compulsive behaviours that we see in BDD, um, but they're also really common in eating disorders. So for example, somebody with an eating disorder might um, uh, have to count calories. Um, they might have to, um, uh, in a sort of very sort of repetitive way, have to monitor the amount of food that they're eating. They might um, have routines that involve checking their body. Um, and um, they might have routines involving exercise. And often these, these behaviors are things that they have to do um, very frequently and in a very specific kind of routine and, and, and ritualized way. There are also similarities between BDD and eating disorders in what we call um, sort of epidemiology. So for example, both um, disorders um, typically um, develop during teenage years. That's the most common time. Um, at which they arise. Um, and that's a little bit different, for example, to OCD, which in young people has a slightly earlier age onset and usually emerges in late childhood. And we also know that BDD and eating disorders um, are more common in women. Um, of course, they can affect anyone, but I think it's been well recognized for a long time that eating disorders um, are more common in women. For example, 90% of um, patients with anorexia nervosa are um, female. Um, the the picture has been less clear with BDD and I would still I, I'd say it's still um, not, not completely clear. There's a bit of a question mark around it. But 
recent studies have shown that particularly in young people, BDD seems to be more common in, in girls. Um, so um, studies in Sweden and in the UK have shown that BDD is six to nine times more common in teenage girls than boys. So there's a lot in common between BDD and eating disorders, but of course there are differences too, um, which are really important to, to recognize. So I've put on this slide some of the main differences. So um, eating disorders tend to involve um, appearance concerns that are about overall body weight and shape and linked with those concerns are unhealthy patterns of eating behavior. So um, restricting, binging and purging, for example. And these eating behaviors uh, are, are designed or, or, or the motivation behind them is, is to lose weight usually. Um, so that's different to BDD where the most common appearance concerns that we see are concerns about facial features. Although I think it's really important to acknowledge that this varies widely and with BDD people can worry about any part of their body and it's often multiple parts of their body. And unhealthy eating or disturbed eating isn't a core feature of BDD. Um, having said that, eating can certainly be affected. So, for example, somebody with BDD might avoid eating um, oily foods for fear that it's going to um, have a negative impact on the quality of their skin. So the motivation isn't weight loss, but there's still um, a, a disturbance to their eating. But what I really want to highlight here is this big overlap in the middle, this big gray area. Um, and in my experience, and I think many um, clinicians um, would agree, patients don't necessarily neatly fall into one or other of these categories. Um, and there really is a gray area in the middle. And I think that's really um, well demonstrated when we think about um, a particular difficulty called muscle dysmorphia. Um, so muscle dysmorphia is, is a form of BDD that most, most commonly affects men. And it's um, defined by a concern um, about lacking muscularity. So people with muscle dysmorphia worry that they're too small. They worry that they um, are not muscular enough. And they go to great lengths to try to increase their muscle bulk. And that often includes increasing their dietary intake, particularly of, of protein rich foods, um, as well as um, lots of exercising and excessive working out. Um, so if we think about this, this form of BDD, it is characterized by over, um, concerns about overall body shape and weight, um, like eating disorders, and it can be linked with really unhealthy patterns of eating behavior. And actually in the past, muscle dysmorphia was formally diagnosed as a form of eating disorder. And people used to talk about it being reverse anorexia because instead of worrying about being too big, people with muscle dysmorphia were worrying about being too small. But actually that's changed over time. And in the current diagnostic manuals, we, we um, include muscle dysmorphia in the diagnosis of BDD. So somebody coming along with, with these difficulties now would get a diagnosis of BDD. So I think this just really demonstrates how muddy the waters are when it comes to sort of separating um, eating disorders and BDD. And of course, as well as this kind of overlap and, and sort of muddy area, it is, a, it is possible to have both disorders at the same time. And actually that's quite common. Um, so estimates have varied, but some research studies have shown that one in three people with BDD meet diagnostic criteria for an eating disorder. And similarly, one in two people with an eating disorder meet diagnostic criteria for BDD. If you ask the right questions, if you screen for it and assess for it, you find it there. Um, so this shows that BDD and eating disorders often go hand in hand, although obviously that's not the case for everybody. So you might be thinking, well, why is all of this important anyway? Why, is it, why does it matter if we um, understand the links between BDD and other mental health disorders? Well, I think it matters for, for a few reasons. One is that if we know, for example, that BDD has really strong links with eating disorders, 
it tells us that clinicians working with eating disorders should be on the lookout for BDD. They should be actively screening for BDD. They should be asking the right questions. And if they do that, it's gonna help us improve detection and diagnosis of BDD. And this is so important because we know that BDD tends to go undiagnosed for many, many years, um, often decades um, before an accurate diagnosis is made. And that means, of course, that people are suffering in silence and they're not getting the right treatment at, at the best time. I think understanding the links between BDD and other disorders is also important because it can help us um, figure out who might be vulnerable to developing BDD in the future. Um, at the moment, we don't have very much information about who's at risk of developing BDD. Um, and this is one route into that, and it will help us think about um, prevention programs and early intervention, um, which um, is very much needed. And it's very likely that the earlier we can intervene, the better the outcomes will be. But also understanding the links between BDD and other disorders might help us improve treatments. Um, so as I'm sure many of you are aware, BDD is really quite an under-researched disorder still, and that includes its treatment. So fortunately, we do have effective treatments for BDD, but I think there's um, still room for improvement. And if we understand how BDD relates to other disorders, we might be able to draw on knowledge of how to treat those other disorders and sort of borrow techniques, if you like, from the treatments of those other disorders in order to um, further develop and improve the treatments and outcomes in BDD. So I'm going to sidestep now to talking about this issue of detail focused processing that I mentioned at the beginning. And I think this is one example of a feature that, that BDD and eating disorders may have in common and that might give us some clues um, to, um, to treatment. So I'll just explain what I mean by detailed focus processing. Um, when most people look at a visual image, a picture or a reflection, they tend to focus on the sort of global, um, bigger elements of the picture, the, the bigger picture, before they hone in or zoom in on details. Um, so that's well established. That's, that's the sort of average way of looking at a visual image. But some people have much more of an eye for detail and they um, do the opposite. They, they focus on details before the bigger picture. And sometimes they actually struggle to, to sort of zoom out, if you like, and, and to sort of process the picture as a whole. They get stuck on the details. So this is a little bit like that, um, that sort of idiom that we hear, um, can't see the wood for the trees. Um, that's saying that you can't see the wood, the, the sort of bigger picture, the overall picture, because you're so caught up looking at the trees, the sort of details, the individual components. And of course, there might be loads of advantages to having a very detailed focused processing style. Um, it might be really helpful in certain occupations like design, for example, um, but there might be certain drawbacks too. If you're really detail focused in your processing, when you look in a mirror, you're gonna be much more likely to notice minor flaws or differences or, or little blemishes in your appearance. And not only that, but once you notice those, it's gonna be really hard to contextualize them um, within the whole of your, your image. Um, so rather than sort of saying, oh, look, I've got um, a pimple on my chin, um, but actually overall my face kind of looks okay, um, it's much more likely that you'll get sort of stuck thinking about those details and focusing on those details and struggle to kind of contextualize it within your whole reflection. And in addition, we know that people with a very detailed focus processing style actually tend to have quite a fragmented or, or piecemeal perception. So they look at detail to detail and, and really do struggle to see the overall picture. And, and what that can mean is that it can, in some situations, slightly distort your perception or, or, or lead you to sort of see things in a different way to other people. And I think a, a good way of thinking about 
this is it's a little bit like um, looking at individual pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And if you look at each piece individually without it being sort of put together, you might get quite a different impression of what the overall picture um, of the jigsaw puzzle is. So the culmination of all of this, um, picking up on minor flaws, um, finding it hard to contextualize them, um, having this sort of fragmented processing style and which might um, impact on your perception. The culmination is that it might lead to, or at least kind of fuel and maintain um, poor body image. And detail-focused processing is, is something that us researchers are able to quantify. We can measure it. And we've got a whole range of different tools and techniques for measuring it. Um, and I'm just going to show you one example. So this is a task that we might give to somebody. Um, and we say, um, this is a target face at the top. Can you pick which of the two bottom, uh, faces at the bottom match up to the face at the top? And that's a pretty easy task for most people. Um, and we measure their reaction times. But the real test of detail focused processing comes in a second version where we turn the faces upside down and we ask the same question. We say, which of these bottom faces match the top one? And actually, if you focus, if you have a global processing style, you tend to see kind of bigger elements of the picture. This is a hard task because you'll probably just look at all these upside down faces and say they're all faces of a female. Um, she has blonde uh, fair hair and it's tied in a ponytail. And it's pretty hard to differentiate the bottom two and work out which one matches. Whereas if you have a much more um, detail focused processing style, you have that eye for detail, you're gonna notice the differences more quickly. And you'll see, for example, that this, um, top person has a center parting and this person has a center parting too, whereas the person on the left has a side parting. So it's gonna get you to the answer quicker and you're gonna figure out these two match. Um, and that's, so in this way, detail focused processing actually enhances your performance in this task and means that you have quicker reaction times. So we can measure reaction time and that gives us an indication of detail focused processing. So using a whole range of tasks like that, and they're not all involving faces, some of them involve very neutral pictures like houses or letters, using these kinds of tasks. Um, many studies have shown that people with anorexia nervosa um, have a more detailed focused processing style than um, people without mental health difficulties. So that's been pretty clearly shown. But what we were interested in, my colleagues and I, is do people with BDD have this same eye for detail? And we had a quick look at the studies that had been done. Um, there had been quite a few studies, but it was clear that the findings had been mixed. And that's pretty common um, in, in any form of scientific research. Um, your findings are going to really depend on um, exactly who took part in your study, um, the methods that you use to assess um, the processing style, the way you analyze the data. So it's not uncommon to have mixed findings. But what we weren't sure about is, is which way the scales were tipping. You know, it wasn't clear whether overall the finding was a yes or a no. Um, so in this situation, there's a tool that we can use to summarize the results of previous studies and to, to, to sort of answer the question of overall, what are they showing? And that method or technique is called a meta-analysis. Um, so my colleagues and I decided to undertake a meta-analysis to look at um, detail focus processing in BDD and anorexia nervosa. And this study was led by Katie Lang, who's also um, based at the BDD clinic for young people um, at the Morsley Hospital with me. And um, this meta-analysis technique essentially averages the results across previous studies. Um, it um, does it in quite a clever way. For example, it gives a slightly greater weighting to bigger studies, which we know produce more reliable results. Um, and so our first step was to really systematically search through the literature to find studies that had been conducted on this topic. And we found 16 studies on um, people with BDD. Um, and 18 on people with anorexia nervosa. And you can see that that equated to 299 um, 
people with BDD in total across these studies um, and 518 people with anorexia. Um, and similar numbers of healthy controls. And by that, what we mean is people who didn't have um, any mental health disorder. So we found these studies, and we um, summarized the results, and we used a meta-analysis technique to summarize the results. And, and these were the results that we found. Um, and I really appreciate that this is not a nice um, figure to look at. So I'm just gonna talk you through it and pull out the most important points. Um, so on each row, each row here represents a different study. So we've got our 16 BDD studies down the side. And on um, this side, the dots um, actually show the results of the individual study. And where the dot appears on the left-hand side of this vertical line, it shows that people with BDD had a more detailed focus processing style than the healthy controls, than the people without BDD. Um, so you can see that there's a bit of a mix, um, a, a bit of a scatter with these results, um, which is what we'd expected. But what's really important is this diamond at the bottom. And this is the summary statistic. So when we average out the results of all the previous studies, um, this is the overall finding. And you can see it's on the left-hand side of this vertical line. So it's showing us that people with BDD do have this slightly over-detailed um, processing style. We did the same thing um, with the studies for anorexia nervosa and found a really similar pattern. So really our, our kind of headline, our, our main message from this study was that yes, people with BDD and people with anorexia nervosa um, do tend to overfocus on details of visual images compared to um, people without mental health disorders. Um, our research can't answer the question of why that is. We don't know whether this is a trait that these people have always had and perhaps made them vulnerable to developing the disorders in the first place. Or on the other hand, perhaps it um, is something that arises as a consequence of having BDD or an eating disorder. Maybe it's a, a sort of symptom, if you like, of having these disorders. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg question. We don't know which one has come first. Um, but what we do know is that this over detailed processing style is probably unhelpful if you have body image problems and it's likely to fuel and maintain BDD. So that really brings us on to thinking then, what can we do about it? Why is this important? What does this tell us for treatment of BDD and for BDD recovery, which is really the most important question. So I think generally what it tells us is that we need to be um, promoting, encouraging or actively training people with BDD to pay attention to sort of the bigger picture, to focus on big elements rather than details. And that could be, for example, when they look in a mirror, when they look at their own reflection. And um, we do have a technique already that kind of does that. Um, so this is a technique called mirror retraining, which is often used in cognitive behavior therapy for BDD. And really mirror retraining is about helping people to, to see themselves as a whole and to not get really fixed on the details, the parts of their appearance that they feel most concerned about when they look in the mirror. Um, so what we do is we, we um, train people to scan their body from head to toe, not focusing on particular features, but instead sort of looking at the, the sort of overall picture, the overall um, reflection. Um, and the second layer to mirror retraining, which is really important as well, is that we, um, we, we train people to, to look at themselves in a very objective way. So just describe their reflection in quite factual terms um, without sort of any um, negative comments or descriptions. So it's about being non-judgmental and objective and really learning to sort of spot those critical thoughts or the kind of bully voice that sometimes comes in um, for people with BDD when they look in the mirror. Um, so our research suggests that this technique of mirror retraining could be really important and a really helpful component of CBT for BDD. But 
training people with BDD to look at the sort of bigger picture and to engage in global processing doesn't have to just apply to looking in mirrors. So we know that people with BDD um, focus on details in a whole range of situations. It's not just when they look at their own reflection in the mirrors, it's not just when they look at faces. So if we know it's a, a sort of global um, trait, then perhaps we should be trying to address it in a wide range of situations as well. And there's a, a psychological intervention called cognitive remediation therapy that really does exactly that. Um, so cognitive remediation or CRT as it's sometimes called is a psychological treatment that is often used in, in eating disorders. And it's often referred to as brain gym because it's a series of sort of mental exercises and puzzles that are designed to change your thinking style. Um, so for example, to promote flexible thinking and not be so kind of rigid and rule bound, um, but also to promote bigger picture thinking, global processing. And I think what's really interesting about cognitive remediation therapy, um, certainly compared to CBT, is that it's very neutral content. So it doesn't involve um, talking or at least no sort of um, detailed discussions of appearance concerns or body image. Um, and I think that can, can make it um, much easier to engage with um, actually for some people um, because we know that talking about appearance worries and body image can be really really hard for people with BDD so with CRT we don't have that barrier it's quite neutral content um, and I think it's important to say this isn't a standalone treatment it tends to be used in combination with other treatments like CBT and the idea is that if you combine it with CBT it might improve outcomes so I'm just going to give you one example of the kind of task that somebody might do if they were um, receiving cognitive remediation therapy. Um, so they might be shown a picture like this and um, told that they need to describe this picture to another person who can't see it themselves. And they need to describe it in a way so that the other person can draw an accurate sort of um, replication of the picture. Now, if you have a very detailed focus processing style, what you're going to do is hone in on very specific elements of this picture and sort of work your way through them one at a time. So for example, you might say, okay, I want you to start off by drawing a small triangle, which has got a slightly curved bottom. And then to the right of that, I want you to draw a slightly larger triangle, which is slightly lower down and it's got a, a bit of a curved top this time. And you can probably see quite quickly that if you carried on like this, it would take a really long time to describe the picture, but also it would be hard for the, the partner, the other person to, to be drawing, um, be quite hard for them to produce an accurate replication of the picture. So it wouldn't be a very good strategy. Um, whereas if you engaged in global processing and sort of described the bigger features, the overall features, you might say, um, start off by drawing a diamond um, in the page and then I'd like you to um, draw a cross on top of that that's centered on the diamond and about the same height and that's going to be much quicker and also much easier for the person drawing. So this task is kind of cleverly designed to really encourage people to, to try to engage in that global processing style to pay attention to the big features and not zoom in on the, the tiny details. And CRT, um, cognitive remediation therapy, involves a really wide range of, of, of puzzles and tasks that are a bit like this. Um, and what we know is that they are actually really effective in changing people's thinking style. And that's been shown in anorexia. So you can train people to think more flexibly. You can train them to pay attention to the bigger picture. And really importantly, there's um, research to show that when you add cognitive remediation therapy into treatment as usual for eating disorders, um, so that involves CBT as well. So when you add CRT, in, um, it actually leads to better treatment outcomes for people with anorexia. So I think this is a really exciting area for, for research in BDD, and we need studies to, to, to test this out and see whether or not cognitive remediation therapy could help improve 
our treatments and outcomes for people with BDD. So I'm just going to finish with a quote um, from a young person who I worked with, and he had um, come to the end of a course of CBT for, for body dysmorphic disorder. And I really liked this quote. It, it sort of jumped out at me because it's something he said spontaneously, but I think it really captures the, um, the importance and the benefit of global bigger picture processing um, in the recovery from BDD. So he said, when I look in the mirror, I still see things I don't like. There are parts of my face that I'm not happy with, but I don't get stuck on them anymore. I realize that now I look at myself as a whole. And when I do that, I'm okay. So I'm gonna finish there. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm really happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Regina. We've got some questions that came through, so I'm just gonna read them out and then you can answer them live and I'll keep an eye on if any more come in. Um, so the first one is, um, how commonly is BDD related with orthorexia? That's a really good question. And I don't think we have data on that at the moment. I think it would be a really great area to study. As I say, we know there's this relationship um, with eating disorders, but there haven't been um, studies looking specifically at orthorexia as far as I know. Um, and, you know, I think the truth is that there's so much we, we don't know yet about BDD. It is a really under-researched um, area and it's um, just so important that um, these kind of questions are flagged up so that us as researchers know, you know, where we should be focusing our efforts and, and um, the kind of things that we should be trying to tease apart in the future. So thank you for the comment and sorry, I can't really answer. So the next question we had that came through was, if you have high feelings of self-worth and a secure attachment style, could detail-orientated um, processing be a problem or an asset versus those with lower, lower self-esteem and an insecure attachment style? Yeah, I think that's a really good point um, because I, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to suggest that detail-focused processing style is, is a negative, a blanket negative, because it certainly isn't the case. Um, and I think a lot of people can flit in and out of different processing styles as well. So I think, you know, some people um, are quite adept at sort of knowing um, when they're engaging in a task that requires them to be quite detail focused and they can use that to their advantage, but they're also able to sort of um, recognize um, the, the way that they are dealing with information and, and switch to a more global processing style when that's needed too. And I think it's probably only um, going to be problematic in terms of body image for people who have certain other vulnerabilities as well. So, you know, there's certainly, um, I wouldn't want to suggest that detail focused processing style is going to be a risk factor for, for BDD for everybody. It, it, it would be one piece of the jigsaw and there are many other factors. So for example, you know, a, a genetic vulnerability or predisposition, um, certain life experiences that you may have had. If all of that comes together, then it might create this sort of perfect storm and an impact on poor body image. So yeah, in terms of your question, I think the, the opposite might be true if you've got very protective factors um, you know, like very um, positive sense of self-worth or really um, um, strong attachments, all of those protective factors um, will um, play a role in sort of reducing your likelihood of developing body image problems as well. Thank you. Um, we've got another one here, which is asking if this attention to detail is a characteristic shared by people with OCD as well. Oh, that's a great question. Yes. And I've been sort of talking about um, the relationship with eating disorders, almost suggesting that it's an alternative to the relationship with OCD. And I certainly don't, you know, think that I actually, we know that OCD is also very closely related to eating disorders. So I think there's a bit of a triangle with OCD, eating disorders and BDD. Um, and yes, there are studies showing that people with OCD also have this detail focused processing style. A bit like with, with um, the starting point that we had before our study, um, with BDD, the findings have been mixed. So I think with eating disorders, it had always been quite a clear picture. The findings were pretty consistent. 
with OCD, the findings have been a little bit mixed. So probably what we need to do is a meta-analysis um, looking at it in OCD so we can get that kind of summary um, view and see overall where the land lies. Okay, we've got another question here, which is asking if there are any links with BDD and binge eating disorder. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, as far as I know, the studies looking at the links between um, BDD and eating disorders haven't really teased apart the different forms of eating disorders. And I think that's going to be really important because it's such a broad category. To, I mean, today I was talking about anorexia nervosa because there has been more research on that. Um, so I don't think we know a huge amount about the links with other forms of eating disorders, but that's really important for us to understand, um, you know, particularly because um, most people with eating disorders don't actually fall in the category of anorexia and most people do have these other you know kind of more ednos eating disorder not otherwise specified or um, you know binge eating disorders and often people move around within these categories as well if they have an eating disorder so i think it's um, going to be something that's important for us to look at in the future we've got three questions here that i think are very closely related so someone's asked if there are any apps you would recommend for cognitive remediation therapy Somebody has asked if there are ex, uh, how you can get access to exercises or puzzles that you described. And another's asked if there are any references um, available for CRT online or should it always be supervised? I believe there are some um, apps and online um, CRT programs. I haven't actually used them myself, so I, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the, the references would be. And I also don't know um, exactly what the content is, so I wouldn't want to necessarily be recommending them. But I know they do exist. They haven't been developed um, specifically for people with BDD. Um, you know, I would probably say that at this stage, um, Although I think it's a really exciting area for future research and you know we've got some data to show that CRT is helpful in eating disorders, we haven't actually um, you know, looked at that thoroughly in BDD. So um, you know, it, I, I think that's something that we need to do first. We need to properly evaluate it and, and check that it really is helpful so that people aren't channeling their efforts and energy into something that isn't really going to make a difference in their life. Um, so, yeah, in terms of accessing resources, I think there are resources available, um, there are apps available, but they're not specific to BDD. Um, and I would say, you know, we probably need to do the research first to check that it works before um, we go down that route. forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> I think we're having lots more questions coming in. We've probably got time for a few more um, if you'd be happy to answer them, but I'm yeah, not sure we'll have a chance to answer all of them. Um, I'm just going to go down the list. Um, so someone's asked, is BDD circuitry the same as OCD circuitry? Um, by circuitry, I'm guessing that we're talking about the sort of um, uh, the neural circuitry in the brain. I think that's probably the question. Um, so I think there are similarities, but there are also differences. So um, a lot of the neuroimaging studies, so the studies that have looked at neural activity in the brain in people with BDD have focused on the sort of visual circuitry um, because of this issue that um, you know, people, people are really trying to understand why is it that people with BDD see themselves in a different way um, to how other people see them. So it makes sense that there's something different happening in the sort of perceptual circuitry. So th that's been the main focus of research in neuroimaging studies of BDD, and that, that isn't so relevant in OCD. Um, so I think, um, yeah, to answer your question, there are some commonalities and in, in overlap, but also there is some evidence to suggest differences in um, the sort of visual circuitry within the brain in people with BDD. Someone's just shared that it's, there's not a question, but just a massive thank you for this, um, that everything you said rings true for them and it makes so much more sense to them now. So they really appreciate it. So I just thought I'd let you know that. Oh, thank um, you so much. That's a really lovely comment. Thank you. We've got someone who's asked, how can we be involved with BDD research? Oh, that's a great question. I know the, the BDD Foundation often um, promotes and advertises specific research, research studies that are happening. And you know, I think if you're willing to take part in research, that would just be amazing for us as researchers because, because BDD um, is often undiagnosed and undetected. It's actually quite hard as a researcher to, 
to recruit people with BDD to a study. Um, it's quite hard to find to find those people. Um, so yeah, if you are interested, I think the BDD Foundation website's a great place to look. And I know any researcher, I can speak for all researchers interested in BDD, they would be incredibly grateful for your, your support. Thank you. We've um, got someone here that's asked, we know that autistic people can have a more detailed focus processing style and that OCD and eating disorders are more common in autistic people. Um, they're not sure about BDD, but they were wondering if there's any research that's looked at this, these links. No, that's a great question as well. That's something I've thought about too, because you're right that there, we know there are strong links between um, OCD and, and, and autism spectrum disorder, those disorders often go hand in hand. And it may be that that's partly to do with the sort of thinking style, so detailed uh, focus processing, um, sometimes quite sort of um, difficulty thinking flexibly and being quite rule, rule bound. And that does seem to apply to BDD. You're right that there aren't studies looking at um, BDD and autism spectrum disorder. That's something that we as a clinic are very interested in looking at. So watch this space. Um, but I think um, my hunch would be that there is a relationship, um, partly because of this um, processing style, but I think also, you know, people with autism spectrum disorders are, are more likely to um, experience um, interpersonal difficulties and negative interpersonal experiences, which um, often are quite relevant to people with BDD as well. So they often describe that they've had um, sort of interpersonal difficulties, maybe negative comments from other people. And that's been a real sort of powerful experience that's shaped their view of themselves and, and, and fed into their body image problems. So I can see different, several different routes for how um, BDD and autism spectrum disorders could, could be linked. Thank you. I think we've probably got time for just one more question, which is a shame because there's lots of really good ones coming in. Um, but this person's asked, is there a connection between increased detail orientation and striving for perfection, which might be observed in BDD sufferers? Yeah, really interesting. I don't think that's been um, looked at explicitly, but it would certainly make sense. And we know separately, um, you know, the study that I've talked about today, that detail focus processing is, is clear in people with BDD. And also we know that perfectionism is, is, um, is common in people with BDD and we've done separate studies looking at that. Um, particularly what we call um, self-oriented perfectionism. So people with BDD often set um, very high kind of internal standards for themselves. It's not necessarily that they think other people have high expectations for them, but they set very high standards for themselves. And then when they fall short of those standards or think they've fallen short, they're incredibly hard on themselves, very critical. Um, so it's that kind of critical element of perfectionism that I think um, is really important in BDD. Um, so yeah, um, great comment, thank you. Thank you very much. I think unfortunately that's all we've had time for, but I'm sure people really enjoyed listening to that. So thank you. Well, thank everybody for the questions. They were really great questions and given me a lot to think about.